Um, I want to start a new series today, uh, which will probably be four messages long, though it will not be successive uh, messages, they won't be consecutive. We'll revisit this short series of messages periodically over the next several months, kind of one at a time. Um, I mentioned that there was something that happened uh, kind of this week or this last week that really made me think about this text, and um, there's a verse in Isaiah chapter 9, and it's verse 6, very often read in this time of year, that's not what got me thinking about it, what got me thinking about it was a particular title given to the Lord Jesus Christ. The verse reads like this, Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. And it's this first title, Wonderful Counselor. And then three other titles, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The text is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want us to briefly consider this passage in its context. And that may deepen each week. I'm not going to say a whole lot about the context this week. I'll say a few things. Maybe each time that we do this, we'll get a little deeper, say a little more. Um, but I want to make sure there's, there's enough time each week that we are looking at this text to look at one of these four titles. So that would mean that today we're going to consider Wonderful Counselor. Then we'll consider Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace um, in the months ahead, however long it takes us to revisit this each time that we, that we do. Um, so now you know kind of where we're headed. Let's Let's pray, and then we'll read Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, and begin to consider the Lord Jesus Christ as, a, as the wonderful counselor. Um, why don't we pray? Uh, Father in heaven, as I look at this text, I can't help but think, uh, as if I was someone who was hearing Isaiah say these things, or reading them shortly thereafter, you just would think, what kind of a person would this be that he's describing? How could it be? Surely this is hyperbole. It, it surely isn't, won't be this good. And yet then we see the Lord Jesus Christ and he uh, just dims these descriptions with his own glory and excellence. And so we're asking, uh, I'm asking, Lord, that you would do in our hearts what I think this text is meant to do to highlight something of the unique glory and beauty and uh, grandeur of Christ, that we would see Him more as He is, that we would fall more in love with Him, that we would lean on Him more as a counselor, as our sage. We wouldn't turn to other sources of wisdom and guidance and direction, but we would cast ourselves, all that we are on You, we'd put all our eggs in one basket and by faith live in the resurrected Christ. And so we pray for you to do that work in us, root out unbelief, root out mistrust, root out wrong errors and ideas, and just demolish every wrong opinion and idea that sets itself up in opposition to the kingship of Christ. We pray you'd have your way with us today. In the name of Christ, for his sake and his honor in our life, we pray. Amen. All right. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Um, this is just after um, Isaiah has been talking some about the destruction that God is going to bring to Israel. Or we might not want to say destruction, that, that uh, implies kind of finality, but at least the severe discipline of Israel in the land. That they were going to be deposed, dispossessed from their land, that we know historically the Assyrians came in and basically the, the, the land of Israel was no longer theirs. Hardly an Israelite lived there and there was great darkness in the land. So here we pick up in chapter 9 verse 1. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. And it sounds impossible. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. You might wonder where those places are, but he goes on. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. That's the area that we're talking about. You think of the life of Christ, Galilee, where he did so much of his ministry. 
The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. Matthew quotes that text when Jesus begins his ministry in Galilee and says, See, it's the fulfillment of this. Light has dawned in Galilee of the Gentiles. They've seen a great light. <coughs> Verse 3, You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil, for the yoke of his burden. So why are, why are the people of Israel getting ready to rejoice as, as, as the joy you have at harvest, to be glad as when in war you win and divide the spoil? This is going to happen. For the reason they're going to be this way, because the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you've broken, as on the day of Midian. What was the day of Midian? You remember... It was uh, Gideon and his army that won, that put the 300, that put all those men to flight with the help of God. The yoke of Israel's burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. So there's coming a day, according to this text, when God's going to do something and the people who, dwell, who ha are in gloom now, who walk in darkness, they're going to see a great light. It's going to shine upon them. They're going to multiply, they're going to increase in joy, they're going to rejoice as though it's the time of harvest, they're going to be glad as though they've won the war and they're dividing the spoil because their, their yoke is, is broken, the staff that beats their shoulder is removed, the rod of their oppressor is, is no longer there, it's broken. For, for every boot of the, uh, of the tramping warrior in bat battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. No need for war, no need for, a, for that kind of thing, for fighting in armies who come against them. Why will all this happen? How will this come to pass? For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. As impossible as it sounds, that, that what's going to bring all these things about is a, son, a child is going to be born. And that son is going to rule, he's going to reign, he's going to sit on David's throne. He's going to be a wonderful counselor. You're, you're going to look at him and, call, and give him the name, the title Mighty God, and it's going to be appropriate. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, his government and peace will increase forever. It sounds impossible, but lest you despair and think it couldn't happen, the end of verse 7 says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is something God has set his, his mind on. He's fixed himself to do this zealously. He doesn't do it halfway. With all of his zeal, he's determined this will happen. It's the kind of thing you think of Psalm 2. The, nations, the, the kings and the nations rage and plot in vain. But God laughs at them and mocks and says, Ha, I've set my king on my holy hill. I've established him. Let the nations do what they want. Jesus Christ is, is the king. And he's going to rule and reign. And... God sets him up on David's throne. We're, we're told that in Isaiah 2. It's where he sits now, where he rules and reigns from heaven. Now, that's something of the meaning there. Let me say a few other things. Um, the names of God, that are, or the names given to Jesus Christ here. You might have read this text at some point and thought, I don't remember any time in the New Testament where Jesus was called Wonderful counselor. Nobody ever went up to him and said, oh, wonderful counselor. We, we do hear good teacher, but we never hear anything. Wonderful counselor. Nobody comes up to him and says, mighty God. There are people who do worship him as God. They recognize that in him, but they don't say mighty God. They don't say everlasting father. I have a question for you. Prince of peace, come make, decide this case between, you know, me and my, uh, my brother. He actually, you remember that when that happened, someone says, there's a, this issue about an inheritance with me and my family. And he says, what's that to me? He refuses to exercise judgment in that case. So you might wonder, what does it mean that he's called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. And I want to just show you 
something here that that'll I think bring clarity and then we'll begin to move on Isaiah 7 14 therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel or God with us so you might read that text and wait around in Israel until someone is given the name Emmanuel so that's their name so they're called that but that's not what happens turn with me to Matthew chapter 1 and we'll see the fulfillment of that text explicitly stated Matthew chapter 1 verses 21 through 23 says this she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus and that's of course what they call him for he will save his people from their sins all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son they shall call his name Emmanuel so in other words, when Isaiah prophesied that they were going to call his name Emmanuel, what he means is, the significance of that, is that people will look upon this child, they will, when they understand what's actually happening in the life of this child, they will say, Emmanuel, God has come among us. It's an appropriate title for the, for the child, though it's not the child's name per se. The, the important thing is that the child is is uh, has the shoulders to bear that title he's able to bear it you know if you were to call any of us Emmanuel if you were to say you know well you know Adam Emmanuel over there I mean he would shun that title because he's not worthy to, to carry it but Jesus Christ is able to carry it and these titles in Isaiah chapter 9 work the same way we call him wonderful counselor because we know something of of who he is and what he's like and we're convinced when you see Christ, when you gaze at him and the life that he lived and the way that he was, you see he really is worthy of that title. It's a fitting description of him. All of these things in Isaiah chapter 9 are fitting of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what I want to do in, this, in these weeks that we consider this text. Um, so the thought is that the child is worthy to bear these names. The king who comes is worthy to bear them. Not that he would be called these things necessarily in his earthly life, but this would be the opinion of those who know him. Each title that we find in, in Isaiah 9 is a two-word title, or a title that kind of puts two ideas together in its description. Wonderful, or a wonder. A counselor, those are together. Mighty and God are together. Everlasting, or eternal, and Father are together. A prince and peace those are together and and each of these two ideas that are put together as a title function as a single title and are meant to give us a single idea which is why they are translated in this way a wonderful counselor a mighty god the everlasting father or the prince of peace so i want us to consider then this first one wonderful counselor um, and we'll start just by looking at the two words that are used first of all wonderful he is Wonderful. Now, when I say something is wonderful, that's an adjective. The meal was wonderful. I'm describing the meal. But the word as used in Isaiah 9 is a noun. He is a wonder. He's a wonder. He himself is a wonder. This word is used other places in the, in the uh, Old Testament, there in Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew language, simply for what you and I might consider miracles. And just to see one place where it's used that way, I want to turn to Psalm 78 and verse 12. Psalm 78 and verse 12. We're just trying to get a feel for the word and the way it's used and how we ought to think about it. Psalm 78 and verse 12. In the sight of their fathers, this is the people of Israel, in the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it. So when you're thinking, Jesus is said to be a wonder. What kinds of things are, are we talking about? We're talking about the category of a wonder. We're talking about dividing the Red Sea. That's one thing. That's a wonder. And made the waters to stand like a heap. In the daytime he led them with a cloud, and all, and all the night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. 
He made stream, streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow like rivers. Those are the wonders, some of the wonders that God has wrought. Dividing the Red Sea, leading by the pillar of fire and cloud, the rock and the desert providing water, the plagues of Egypt and all the rest. These mighty miracles are called by this same name, wonders. Judges 13, 18, this angel of the Lord has asked his name. He says, it's too wonderful for you. What does he say? He actually says, it's a wonder. And doesn't mean it's curious or you're, it, it's hard to figure out. It means it's too great for you. It's beyond your comprehension. It's a wonder. And that's what we mean when we talk about miracles, right? We don't mean a miracle is an impossible thing. We mean a miracle is a, is a mighty thing that God did. Is an exercise, he exercised his power in a way that we can't explain. It's too high for us. It's a wonder. It's beyond us. And the Lord Jesus Christ here is said to be a wonder. And we could stop there and just look at all the ways that that's true. That he himself in his person is a wonder. He's a walking miracle. He's the greatest miracle ever on the face of the earth. God incarnate. And yet, it, the text goes beyond that. One other passage on this, just I'll just read to you. You don't need to turn there. Job 37, 5 says, God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. That's the kind of thing we mean when we say a wonder. Now, this child who's going to be born will be, you, you won't be able to comprehend him. <clears throat> we find that in his own life, right? There he is, he's 12 years old in the temple, asking questions and learning. And his parents were looking all over for him. He says, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? Even at 12 years old, his own parents didn't understand him. He had a life with his father and a, a, that, that sounded depths that his parents couldn't understand. They, they couldn't reach the bottom of it. He himself could teach men. When he was just a young child, nobody understood the relationship he had with his father. He himself was a wonder. So this idea is that Jesus is himself a wonder, a miracle, the mighty, awesome demonstration of the glory of God. But he's also called a counselor. You think of that. Kings often have counselors, don't they? We see in our own president, he has a cabinet who advise and guide him in his decisions and the implementation of his goals. He needs help. He has counselors. He surrounds himself with those who he thinks are wise and capable. It was no different in the ancient times. Kings surrounded themselves with good and wise counselors. It was even a proverb at the time. Proverbs 20, verse 18. Plans are established by counsel. By wise guidance, wage war. If you're going to go to war, you better talk to a lot of people first if you want to win. It was a proverb. It is amazing here, in light of that fact, that this king will himself bear the title counselor. What do I mean? If kings surround them, typically surround themselves with counselors, it's amazing that this king won't, won't be called an availer of counselors, but himself the counselor. It's as though this king needs no cabinet. He needs no counselors. He himself is the counselor. You might remember Solomon who was wiser than any other man. But he himself had counselors as well. But in general, it was his wisdom, Solomon's wisdom, that led and blessed the people and made the nation great, such that kings and dignitaries from all over the world came to hear and to witness the wisdom of Solomon for themselves. How can it be? I've heard a man is so wise. I, the things I've heard, the rumors I've heard couldn't be possible. But even if they're half true, I'm going to venture all across the world to hear for myself. That was Solomon. And he himself had counselors. Jesus, you remember, compares himself to Solomon. And the generation who did not follow Jesus to the generation who did follow Solomon. He says, one greater than Solomon is here. But here, this king himself that Isaiah is talking about will bear the title counselor. In other words, he will need no counselor. He will be known as the counselor. All people will come to him for Counsel. So the title as a whole, a wonder counselor. You might think of it, rephrase it this way, a wonder of a counselor or a miracle counselor. He's a counselor when you go, when you need a miracle with regard to counseling, you go to Jesus and he doesn't disappoint. He's a miracle counselor. He's a wonder of a counselor. He's a wonderful counselor. 
It doesn't just, you know, our, the way we use that word wonderful just means he's really good. And that's not good enough. That's not high enough for the way the word is meant and is employed in this text. He's a miracle counselor. A wonder of a counselor. A miracle of a counselor. Think of this. It leads us to believe, that this title leads us to believe that this king will be such a counselor that he will put people in awe. He will remind people of God in the way he renders his decisions and counsels. And we'll see that in a few moments. I mean, the idea is you go to this counselor with some problem and you walk away thinking, feeling like you've heard from God himself. But what is a counselor for? You're in this impossible situation, right? You need counsel. You need help. Or you're just not sure, so you go and ask a few others. What do they think? You try to get clarity. You try to get certainty. You try to get a perspective that you don't have. Somebody's got some knowledge and some insight into this situation. You're pretty sure that can help you, and you don't have it. So you try to ask people that might. That's a counselor. And the Lord Jesus Christ is said to be a miracle of a counselor. Well, what qualifies the Lord Jesus Christ to be such a counselor? How is he qualified to be such a counselor? Well, if we're thinking of him in his, in his humanity, I could mention this text, Isaiah 11:2, 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> in regard to his humanity, walking around this, this earth in his humanity, the Spirit of God was upon him, Isaiah 11:2. And shall it rested on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. If you want to go seek someone for counsel, it's the one who God has set his spirit on for counsel. The spirit of counsel rests upon Christ. You remember the spirit of God rested upon Moses to lead the people. Then it passed by laying on of hands onto Joshua to lead the people. Well, here the Spirit of God is said to rest upon this king, specifically the Spirit of counsel. And so he's going to render remarkable counsel. What else qualifies the Lord Jesus Christ to be such a counselor? Well, it was it, it said there in that verse too that the fear of the, of the Lord was upon him. He simply walked nearer to God than anyone else. Isaiah, Isaiah, I think it's 55, says he, he's going to have the tongue of those who are taught, the tongue of a disciple. God was going to speak to him day by day, moment by moment, give him words to teach. Jesus him, himself says that my father has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I speak these things that you might have life. What a counselor. Now I want us to consider here for a little bit some of the examples of counseling from the Lord's earth, earthly life. I want you to see it. I it's not enough for me just to tell you, well, he was a really great counselor. I want you to see it. I want you to see the way he stands head and shoulders above anyone ever with regard to account, this thing of counseling. Two categories I want to consider here. First of all are arguments and tests that were put against him. And then, second category, personal answers given to people according to their true need. So first of all, some of the arguments and the tests that men put to him, thinking they'd trip him up and surely they're going to catch him. And then secondly, personal answers that he gives to people according to their true need. Every one of these texts that I'm going to look at deserves at least a message on its own, surely. Uh, but d due to the nature of what I'm trying to do to kind of give you a, a, a wide picture, a wide scope of things, we're going to kind of skim through them. And I'll just highlight certain things as we go. But it is important that you understand something of the, uh, each incident. And so we we'll, we'll, won't be able to go too quick. I'm going to have to explain some things about each text. Uh, so first of all, arguments and tests put against him. If you turn with me to Matthew chapter 22, I thought this was the best place to turn because there's so many of them in this chapter. Keep us from turning around a lot. Matthew 22, verses 15 and following. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his talk. How to entangle him. 
I don't know if any of you have ever experienced anything like this. But if you have, if, uh, growing up, my brother and I do this to each other all the time. We'd get in some argument about something, and we'd try to catch, it, catch each other in something so we could kind of win the argument by something that they said. They didn't realize they were saying. It's hard enough to do that when you have one person trying to trip you up. And it's just, it's frustrating. It's like, just, you know what I mean. But here's a whole group of people, experts in the law, who give themselves, they live by the law. They devote themselves to the teaching of the scribes. And they sit out and plot together how to entangle him in his talk. And they come up with the hatch of plan. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. So they start out with flattery to get his guard down. And you don't care about anyone's opinion, for you're not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled. They marveled. And they left him and went away. Now we read that because we know Jesus says this, and we just think, oh yeah, and we're just w- waiting for the next line, and we don't, we're not amazed by it. But when he gave his answer, those who thought they had him marveled. They were shocked. They came with a foolproof plan for the Lord Jesus Christ to trap him. Because if he says it's, it's lawful to give taxes to Caesar, you should give your taxes to Caesar, then he's encur- it seems like he's encouraging the Jews not to give the proper homage to God. He's saying Caesar's the one in charge, which is a problem if you're a Jew because you believe that Messiah is coming and he's our ultimate authority. And this imposter, this invader from Rome is just kind of a temporary nuisance. We don't really owe him anything. We're just trying to stay alive. But if you say it's not lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, then what do they do? Well, notice it was the Pharisees and the Herodians who come together. The Herodians are going to go right to the the Roman soldiers, right to Pilate and these others, and say, go get him. He's breaking the law. Their interest isn't in really finding out what God thinks about this matter and what they should do. They just want to trap him. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And nobody could win. They all had to walk away empty-handed. They couldn't trap him. He sets the stage in in that one statement for the separation of church and state, if you think about it. I mean, it's incredible. Some of the most helpful ideas and ways of thinking about how Christians engage in a lost world were given by Jesus in the midst of this trial where they're trying to trip him up and test him. I mean, the best you could hope for is just to walk away without having to give an answer. But Jesus himself comes and gives an answer that confounds everyone, and they leave him, marveling at his wisdom. Matthew 22, verses 23 and following, the very next verse. Here we go. The same day. Aren't you glad you don't have this this kind of thing happening to you? The same day. Sadducees came to him, who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies, having and he goes through this whole incident, right? This guy dies having no children, and his brother has to marry the widow, raise up children for his brother. So they remind him, remember that's the law? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Now there were, verse 25, Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. Now you remember, of course, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. So you can picture them saying, almost kind of elbowing each other, so uh, Jesus in the resurrection. You know that, that fairy tale you've, you've been teaching people. That somehow they're going to get life in the resurrection. You're going to raise people up. We all know that's not true. You're a liar. So we've thought about this. We have this test we like to use from the Pharisees, and they just never answer us. And so we're going to put it to you. Here's the question. You remember that law Moses gave? So in, this, in the kind of situation like this where this guy dies on down through, and these brothers die, who, who's, uh, 
whose wife will this woman be in the resurrection? Verse 29, but Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. What a challenge. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So here's some of the Sadducees come up. They present this problem. Jesus answers, and everybody who was gathered around just waiting to see what would happen, they're all astonished at his teaching. It's incredible. Incidentally, I, this is the text I always use uh, when certain men come knocking at my door about the resurrection. These Mormons come and you know, they've always, they all got their own world. They're going to inhabit with their family. And I just, I don't turn to the text, I just say, here, I got a question for you. And I present the same exact problem the Sadducees committed, gave to them. And they all give me the answer, well, so the first, first husband. And I just say, okay, let's look what Jesus says. Surely you're wrong, for you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And I give them the answer. And it, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, uh, it pr prompts long discussions or quick door closings, either one. Uh, both, both happen. Nonetheless, it's there. You see the Lord Jesus Christ, His wisdom, and His answer. Nobody can answer Him. Verse 34, But when the Pharisees heard that He had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. I mean, they'd already been silenced once, but they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked them a question to test Him. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the, great commandment in the law? So they, you can imagine the Pharisees always having their debates. Which, what's the greatest law, the highest law? What's the most important one? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. No answer. In, as recorded in Matthew. It's an amazing thing. How about verse 41? Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. He turns the tables, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said, Well, he's the son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, in the Spirit, that is, or under inspiration, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If, David, if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Not from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Not from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. What a thing. What a showing the Lord Jesus Christ had there that day. Conundrum after conundrum. Impossible situation after impossible situation. Well, whatever he answers... We know we've got an argument against them. You can imagine the Pharisees. You know, there's some guys who say this law is the greatest. Others say this law is the greatest. Others this one. Say, well, which one will we choose? Well, whichever one we choose, the others can pounce on him. And he doesn't choose one of those at all. And he says the, 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 the chief thing is that you love God and serve God and live for God and that you love man and live for man. And on, that, on those two things depend everything else. And what are you going to say? I mean, what? No, the greatest law is that you don't have an idol. You're, he already said you're supposed to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Everything else depends on these two laws. How about another one? Famously, John chapter 8. This is the last text we'll look on this. John chapter 8. This woman who was caught in adultery, you remember. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, 
he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Now, there are questions that this text brings up, admittedly. Things we don't know for sure. Everybody always wants to know what he wrote on the ground and all that kind of stuff. Look, just there's other times we can look at those things and try to discern some of the, the questions we have in the text. But let's just say this for now. Just consider the situation. Picture yourself there on the street. Maybe, maybe you're too far off and you want to know what is wrote right on the ground, but you can't see it or you don't know what's going on there. You're, you're there on the edge of the alley looking in and you see the scene. I mean, just think, just look at what he's done. They bring this woman caught on the very act of adultery. Right in the midst, they're out, out by the temple. They brought her in, in, in her filthiness, in her shame, in her wretchedness. Brought her in, called out her sin in front of everyone else. Said, look at this woman. She was caught in the very act of adultery. Now the law says, the law that God gave said we should kill her now with stones. What do you say? And again, of course, they want to test him. They want to catch him. What's the test? Well, Jews aren't authorized to kill under Roman law. You don't stone somebody like this. So if he does, you arrest him. If he says no, you say, see, he doesn't care about God's law at all. He's caught. He's trapped. And they continue to ask him to press him on this. And he says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, however you see that, I certainly I've got a view. But you look at that, and, and I'm not going to explain it because we don't have time to analyze it all, but he's, he makes this statement, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And the oldest ones, the wisest. I mean, you picture, it's as though you picture you've got some younger guys who start picking up stones, and they're looking around and wondering why the older men are sitting still, paralyzed beginning to sweat. And they turn around and they walk away. And the young men drop the stones. And they walk away too. Maybe some of them they know why, others they're not sure why. They, gotta, they say, hey, and they ask the old man, why did you leave? We're not told exactly what happened there. But they all left. And Jesus says, he was alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. He was able to provide her pardon, to minister life. He came not to condemn sinners, right? But to save them. And he did it. Even in the, even in the face of the demands of the law, he found a way to pardon, condemn sinners, and set them on a new course, living for God exactly what he does on the cross, of course. But he found a way to do it here, even in the midst of this hostile crowd. What a tremendous counselor. How about some others? Another category. Four texts to look at. Uh, let's turn to, we're in John now, so let's, let's look there. John chapter 3 and verse 3. Jesus answered Nicodemus, this rabbi who came to him at night, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I mean, here's, here's Nicodemus. Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. No one can do these signs you do unless God's with them. We know you're from God. We know God's with you. We know God's got his hand upon you and what you're doing. And he says, look, you can't even see my kingdom or what I'm doing unless you're born of God. What wisdom, what faithfulness, what love to this man Nicodemus this Pharisee. I mean, most of us, you, you wouldn't have thought you'd go tell, you need to tell the religious teacher, you need to be born again. You have no idea what's going on here. You're blind. And it's brought out, I mean, his, his wisdom in this. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And skip on verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus is teaching him about his need to be born again, to have God do a mighty work in his life, to recreate him, that he might 
live for God, no longer for sin. And Nicodemus says, how can that be? Come on, Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? How can it be that you've read your Old Testament, and you're a teacher of, of God's Word, and you don't know this? It's all over the Old Testament, of course. But it's incredible. He's faithful to this man. He, just, he doesn't just leave him. He's faithful to declare these things to him. To speak to this religious teacher of his need to be born again. And I would say the temptation for most of us, you find some guy who's a religious teacher, either you, you see that he's got reality in his life and you commend him, or you see he's a hypocrite and you condemn him. But who, how many of us go to that man who's a shyster, a religious you know, hack, and go to him and say, you, not, you must be born again, and plead with him for his soul. The Lord Jesus Christ did it here. Not only such love, but such wisdom. How about John chapter 4, right? This woman at the well. Remarkable, remarkable occurrence here. He begins to talk with her about her need, and she wants to talk about uh, where we're to worship, right? This immoral woman, and you talk, I mean, this happens all the time, right? There's some, I mean, it happens to me at work all the time. There's these guys, I mean, I know they're living in sin. They're totally ungodly. They don't care for God at all. And when something spiritual comes up, they, they want to talk about, I don't know, there's one guy, he's, he's, uh, he wants to talk about food. So like, well, you know, Christians, you know, they, they eat things that the law says they're not supposed to eat, and they wear mixed clothes and all this stuff. It's like, okay, there's this debate that is, you can argue about whether it's legitimate or not, but some people have about what people are to wear in this kind of thing. And uh, he wants to talk about that. He doesn't want to talk about his soul and his real need. He doesn't want to talk about God's demands upon him. He just wants to talk about, you know, what he perceives as hypocrisy among believers. And Jesus has none of it. What He gets to her in verse 16. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband. Come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you're right. What's he say? You're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now, most of us would have thought, if you were standing in front of a woman like that, and you're going to plead with her about her soul, that you don't just put your finger right on that point. I mean, a woman does not have a right in this culture to, to divorce a man. So, so you've got, you've got uh, five men who have married her and had their fill of her and just dismissed her and put her out on the street. That's her life. And she's with a guy now. She's married. She's, she's living with him, but he's not willing to care for her. She, he's not married her. He's not providing for her in that way. She's just there. She's down like that, and Jesus says, yeah, you're right, you don't have a husband. Let me tell you, five men have had their fill of you and dismissed you, and the guy you're with now won't have you either. And you think, how insensitive. And yet it was exactly what needed to happen to minister life to this woman. What does she say? <laughs> the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. How could you have known these things about me? Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. He says, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming neither on this mount, when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. Salvation is from the Jews. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is seeking such people to worship him. There's an invitation to that woman. The Father is seeking people to worship him who will do it sincerely the woman said to him i i know that messiah is coming he was called christ when he comes he will tell us all things and jesus said to her i who speak to you am he and what does she do what does she do verse 28 so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people come see a man who told me all that i ever did can this be the christ wonderful wonderful encounter with this woman what a counselor. You would not have chosen a counselor in this way. But he did. He's a miracle counselor. Let's look at two texts in Luke. And we'll move on. Luke chapter 10. Verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, 
what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've answered correctly. You do that and you'll live. Yeah, live perfectly and you'll, you'll get life from God. Never sin in your life and you'll, you'll, do, you'll do well. But he, des- but he desiring to justify himself. No, the man, knowing he doesn't earn up, live up to this requirement, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied and tells this story about this good Samaritan. And he ends this way. Verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. He exposed this, guy, this man's error with absolute clarity. And the guy has a need. He answers correctly from the law. He's got a lot of insight, but he desires to justify himself. And Jesus presents him with an impossible situation for this man. You can't justify yourself. It, it, this, this, young, this rich young ruler, he's desired to justify himself. In other words, there are people in his mind that he's, he can think of that he's not loving as himself. There are names and faces he's aware of, but he wants to justify himself. What he wants to do is get an answer from Jesus that says those people are not in the category of neighbor. So you don't need to worry about those people that you're thinking about. And Jesus says, no, 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 you've got to be a neighbor to everybody. You've got to be that kind of person like this good Samaritan was to everybody you know, everybody you meet. And, cast, and, and what's he doing? He's, casting, he's causing the man to have conviction of sin, to be cast on God for mercy, not to justify himself. He's seeking to give that man life, to point him to the only source for life that he, can ha- that he has, forgiveness from Christ. Luke chapter 18, verses 22 and following. Let's look at verse 18. In a, Luke 18, 18. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Same kind of question. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus looking at him with sadness said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Then those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Now I want you to listen to this. We always take these truths and kind of pull them out of this passage. It's just incredible. This man says, look, I mean, he's a devout religious man. He's a rich young ruler. He's, he's, I mean, it's, life turned out pretty well for him, but he himself has been devout, careful to keep the law. And whether, you know, surely he's wrong. He's not perf- been, been perfect in this sense. But I just take it at face value. He feels like his conscience is clean. He, he says, look, I've done all those things since my youth. All the things you said to do, I've done all those things. And Jesus says, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Jesus knows his lack. He's, got, he's an idolater at heart. He loves these, these riches. And so he tells the man, the one thing you lack, rather than say, well, I'm not sure that you really have done those things. I don't sure. I mean, is there a time ever in your life that you've ever lied, even about a little thing? Are you sure you've never lied? Sure, Jesus can win that argument. That's not the point. This guy is an idolater at heart. Jesus says, I tell you what, if you really want to have eternal life, abandon everything you have. That idol that's in your heart, you leave it all and just come follow me. Have me. Let go of everything else you have and just come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was, the text says, extremely rich. And we always hear, you know, that Jesus says how difficult it is for those to have wealth to enter the kingdom. But listen to the text. Jesus, looking at him with sadness, says to him. So, I mean, here it is. Jesus says, come follow me. You'll have treasure in heaven. Sell all that other stuff. You come follow me. 
have treasure in heaven. And the man's dejected. And Jesus looks at him with sadness and says, how difficult it is, brother, friend, for you to inherit eternal life with all those riches that you have, with all that stuff you're holding on to. I tell you this, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for you to get life. He's pleading with the man, let go. What, what a counselor. He's a miracle counselor. Those who he heard it, they, there's people around, it's not a private conversation. People are seeing this interaction. And the man walks away, dejected, we're told from other, the other uh, biblical accounts. He walks away, sad. It's incredible. The guy just had, Jesus Christ said, this is all you need to do to get eternal life. And the guy walks away. I'd rather have riches. It's difficult. It's difficult. Had the Lord not looked him in, I mean, the Lord's pleading with him, trying, looking him in the eye. Let go of those things. The man won't do it. But Jesus himself, such a faithful counselor, None of us would have counseled this man this way. We wouldn't have seen fit to do it. Well, what else? And we're running out of time. I understand that. But let's look at this. Uh, some examples of counseling from the rest of the New Testament. Those are some things from the life of Christ. Some examples of counseling from the rest of the New Testament. I just have one I want to consider. Um, and it's just, I'll just read it. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 to 31. Paul writes about what it is to become a Christian, what it is to have had Christ, to have found Christ in the world, to have been lost and now found Him. And he makes this statement, and the, the way he words it, it's, it's anticipated, it's expected by him that every Christian in the New Testament, every Christian there in Corinth will agree with this statement and, put, and underscore it themselves and affirm it. And it's this, And because of Him, because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us, wisdom from God. Isn't that your experience? That having become a Christian, that Jesus Christ has become for you wisdom from God. That you find yourself in situations, in trials, in difficulties, in circumstances that are too great for you. What you find to be true is exactly what Paul says here, exactly what the New Testament church could say as well. That Jesus Christ has become for you wisdom. Divine wisdom. And he says this, he is, who has become to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. So Christ has become for you wisdom from God, among other things, with this result intended by God, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The idea is that Christians are people who boast about the wisdom they've received from God in the person of Jesus Christ. Does that describe you? Do you think of Christ in that way? You've got a wonderful counselor in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's become to you all the wisdom you need. That was exactly the testimony of Paul. That's the way he understood the working of God in his day, the working of God in, every, in the life of every Christian. Jesus Christ, by God's working, became wisdom for us so that we would boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just some examples of counseling you could see in your own life that you've witnessed from testimonies of other people. Let me just give it to you this way. Think of this. How many people have you heard in the, when they give their testimony of the way God's worked in their life that they were in this situation where they were in a failing marriage perhaps that was beyond rescue and God redeemed it. God gave grace. God showed them the way forward in that marriage and brought healing and restoration. Hopeless individuals. I think of, uh, you know, this pastor we know there in Springfield, Illinois, Kurt Daniel, you know, and there he was. Right, he tries to overdose with drugs, <laughs> kill himself. He's there sitting on the park, on, on the, right on the, on the sidewalk. These guys go see him passed out, they hit him over the head with a bar, try to kill him, mug him, take his money, people walk by, <laughs> it's crazy, see him bleeding, rush him to the hospital, 
They find out he's pumped full of drugs. They pump his stomach. And the whole time he was trying to run from God. God was heavy upon him about his sin. He couldn't run from God. He realized, I can't even run from God. His words in a hippie drug party. And there he is. He's, God spared his life and he realizes what God has done and he, come, he gives his life to Christ. Wonderful truth. Hopeless individuals saved by Christ. Guilty, despairing souls. They've done something too great to be forgiven. They've done something that they could never come to God. And what does God say? My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. The sinner will be pardoned. What a wonderful text there from Isaiah. Disillusion, men and women. Counseled by God into life and security and peace and hope and a way forward. Or said elsewhere, what does God regularly do? He takes the things that are to confound the things. He takes the things that are not and, con and confounds the things that are. He chooses men like you and me, the least and the lowest in the world. And he sets his grace on us. It's remarkable truth. It's wonderful truth. The power and the wisdom of God. The, even the foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of men. Jesus Christ, this great, Wonderful, glorious counselor. I mean, think about it. It's true. Because of who God is, because of who Christ is as a counselor for us, those impossible situations you deal with are not impossible. They're not impossible to God, which means they're not impossible at all. What does God say? I will counsel you with my eye upon you. That's the hope of every Christian. Now, let me, next thing I want to do. I want to give you an encouragement and an exhortation to use Jesus as a trusted counselor. An encouragement and an exhortation to use him as a trusted counselor. Colossians 2, 1 through 8. You can turn there if you want. If you're not really familiar with this text, we just went through it a couple of years back in detail. But Colossians 2, 1 through 8 says this. Paul says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea. And for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery. What's, what's God's mystery? Which is Christ. And what's true of Christ? In verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Right, it's true. That, I mean, men can know a lot of things. But everything worth knowing, all the treasures pertaining to wisdom and pertaining to knowledge are all found in Christ. And they're hidden there in Christ. Everything worth knowing. Every great thing you need is found in Christ. Why does Paul tell them that? Well, verse, next verse. I say this, I'm telling you that everything, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, all great revelation, everything great that you could ever come to know in life is found in Christ. And I'm telling you that so that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, he says. People come through and presenting this way of knowledge and that way of knowledge or this spiritual practice or that spiritual practice. I want you to understand all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ. And, I want, and I'm telling you that because I don't want people to delude you. For though I'm absent in body, though I'm not with you there to remind you of these things, yet I'm with you in spirit, and I rejoice to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ, that you've not been led astray. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in Him, be rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, and see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Why not? I mean, Paul's a loving man. Don't you want the best for people? Of course he does. Which is why he tells you to stay with Christ alone. Because all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge belong in him. Don't go searching for other sources of knowledge. The Colossians were being led astray by these various teachings that were coming in. And Paul says, no, everything you ever need, everything that's worth knowing is found in Christ. Resist the, the temptation for other things. It's all found in Christ. There's an encouragement, an exhortation to you. Listen. <laughs> Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, 
Why? Because all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in him. Well, how do you use Jesus as a trusted counselor? How do you do this? Well, we've got the Bible itself. We have prayer. We have counsel from other Christians. Just read a, I'll just read some text on this. We don't, I don't mean to elaborate at all. I just want to read them. Psalm 111 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. You need counsel, you need guidance, you need wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the first step one, how you avail yourself of Jesus as a trusted counselor, you, put, you give him great regard, great honor, you fear God, you bow the knee to Jesus Christ. That's, how you, that's step one to availing yourself of his counsel. Psalm 119, verse 99. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. You give yourself to the word of God. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Psalm 119, verse 30. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. So we get in the word. We know the word. We memorize the word. We give ourselves to the counsels and the oracles of God. These living words. Prayer. Prayer. James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. Ask God in faith. Father, I, this situation is beyond me. I need wisdom. I need to know what to do. I've got to make a decision tomorrow morning, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Lord, help, help, help. What does he say? He gives generously. We pray. Counsel from other believers. So, Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. But you should seek that counsel from Christians not from the lost. Why? Well, I won't read the whole text, but in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 5, you have this whole situation where believers were going to law against other believers. There were disputes rising up. Paul says, don't go to law. Aren't, don't you know you're, you Christians are going to judge the angels? Surely you're competent enough to judge these trivial cases. You ought to seek counsel from those who have the mind of God, from Christians. What's the last way we can avail ourselves? of the wisdom of God. It's this, Hebrews 5, 14. Listen to this. Solid food is for the mature. Who are, what's a mature Christian? For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. In this situation, you need wisdom to know what's right and what's wrong. Listen, putting these things into practice, the things that you do know to be true of God. If you're living a life where you're putting these things into practice, where you're living these things out, what happens? You have your powers of discernment trained. You become more and more discerning throughout your life over time as you obey God. It's not enough just to study the Word and know what God's Word says. If you're not putting it into practice, you're not going to have discernment. You're not going to know what to do. But if you're living these things out, if you're obeying Christ, you have your powers of discernment trained. How are they trained? By constant practice. So we walk in the light that we have. That's the one thing. You want more light, you walk in the light that you have, and God will give you more. And then I just want to end with this. Some promises from God concerning his counsel. Some promises given to us from God concerning his counsel. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and what will he do? He will make straight your paths. In everything, acknowledge God. Lean on him. Lean on him. Don't trust your own understanding. Lean on God. Not on your own understanding. Lean on him. And he'll make straight your paths. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. This is a statement by Jesus we don't often think of as a promise. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on a rock. What glorious truth. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Jesus Christ promises in this text that if you'll build your life, if you'll hear his words and do them, you'll stand in the storms of life, right? But he also assures us that if you hear his words and do not do them, you will fall. Great, and great will be your fall. 
You need the counsel of God in your life. And here's a promise from God. You build your, your life on His words and you'll stand. Psalm 32, verses 8 through 11. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you, would, you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. If you're in relationship with God, this is true of you. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I'll counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. What's all this rejoicing and shouting happening with regards to? It's this. He's going to instruct you in the way you should go. You've counsel. He's going to counsel you with his eye upon you. And he says, look, when I'm counseling you and instructing you, don't be like that mule. You've got to put a bit or a bridle and to turn it the way it needs to go. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Rather, be glad. Rather, he says, uh, or he says, steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. So when I counsel you and say, turn this way or that way, do it. Trust me. Steadfast love surrounds that one. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. One final reason to gain the wisdom that comes from God is simply this. Listen to its description. James chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. Every Christian I know wants this in their life to a greater degree. James 3, 17 to 18. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits. It's impartial, it's sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now that wisdom, he says, comes from above. It comes from Jesus Christ, this wonderful, mighty miracle of a counselor. And I'll, I said it earlier, I'll just say it again. There are no impossible circumstances, impossible situations for the Christian if he'll avail himself of the counsel of God. We feel that way all the time. So many times we get in, situa in some circumstance and we, we just agonize over the decision to be made. What to do? Seems like there's no clear answer. Well, it's not the way it is. God says, I'll counsel you with my eye upon you. I'll give you that answer. I'll provide you with what you need. What a wonderful promise from God. Well, admittedly, we went through many things and we went through them in a cursory way just trying to present this picture and remind you of this truth that Jesus Christ is a miracle counselor. He's a wonder of a counselor. You sit down and you listen to the counsel that God, I mean, isn't it true? I mean, even just think of the testimonies that you know, the lives that God has changed with his words, through his word, with his counsels, with his instructions. It is amazing. Testimony after testimony. We could go around this room of lives changed and transformed. Because of the counsel of Jesus Christ. He's a wonder of a counselor. Oh, amen. Are there questions or comments anyone has on, on what we've looked at?